Hey folks, Nvidia has finally dropped their, quite frankly, ridiculous GeForce Partner Program, which has seen the likes of ASUS, MSI and Gigabyte all removing AMD from any gaming branded GPUs. Now it's finished but it has been going on for about two months, and when investigating this I kind of found myself at a bit of a fork in the road. Originally when building the Ryzen 7 system I used the ROG Strix B350-F motherboard. And the plan was to, when the next generation of graphics cards came out, get AMD's next gen graphics cards in its ROG guise to match with the motherboard and still allow me to take advantage of my FreeSync monitor. So at the time when an AMD ROG build was just out of the equation, it made me start to look at other motherboard options and after the really nice experience I had with the mini ITX sized ASRock Vitality board, it left me with one glaring question after a bit of research. And that's why are more people not raving about this, the ASRock Killer SLI. Now ASRock's top tier Tai Chi models have always been great Halo models, and the Fatality boards have always appealed to those wanting the gamer aesthetic. And then there's the Pro 4, which is a lot more subdued in terms of look and gives you the bare bones that you really need for a high performance system. But what if you wanted a bit of all three? You need the best combination of price, performance, features and looks, while still having a bit of a cutting edge to it. Well, I guess that's where this, the Killer SLI X370 board comes in. This is of course an X370 chipset, and that is the flagship chipset from AMD, and it provides everyone with a wealth of connectivity options. Here we get a total of 12 USB 3.1 ports, and that includes a Type-C, which are all high current, which is going to ensure good compatibility if you've got a VR headset, an RGB header for the Ryzen stock fans, along with two additional RGB headers for LED strips, which provides plenty of customization options for those who want to get a bit of a colour into their system. Looking at the packaging though, it is quite easy to see why the Killer SLI might be overlooked. It is a rather toned down package, despite that massive K skewed on the box. But the packaging is functional, it tells you everything you need to know about the board on the back, and inside you get the usual host of accessories. A high bandwidth SLI bridge is included, a couple of SATA data cables, and screws for all three of those M.2 slots. Now jumping onto the board itself, and here we get a nice neutral colour scheme, black and white. And often the black-white colour combo can either look fantastic or cheap, with very little room to fall in between. Thankfully though, the Killer SLI falls into the former and absolutely nails it in the looks department. As Rock have wholeheartedly dived into this theme, we also get a nice white shroud over all the rear I.O. and audio sections, and matching VRM heatsinks and of course that big massive K on the main body. We also get two PCIe 16 slots which are steel covered, and there's also a double space in between them which is really nice and ensures good compatibility for triple slot coolers. We also get an additional 4x PCIe 1 slots crammed in there too, so there is plenty of room for expansion and the space in between everything is sensible so you can actually use the slots. Taking a look up at the top of the board, we've got a 12 phase power delivery 8 plus 4 and this helps provide stable power as well as really nice alloy heat spreaders that help keep the components cool. A nice feature of these is that even though they look quite flat, there's actually a considerable amount of surface area. And the rear is also finned and that's going to help you with heat dissipation. There is a pair of 4 pin fan headers up in the upper right and one of which can put out 1.5 amps for use with a water pump. I should note though that the RGB header, say for your Wraith Spire or Wraith Prism cooler, is located elsewhere on the board. And we can see this when we're moving around the board clockwise to beside the RAM slots. We see the two 3.1 USB Gen 1 headers alongside the 24 pin ATX socket. And it's below these that we find the CPU RGB header. It's a tidy arrangement overall, although some creative routing of cables is required to give that ultimate clean look. Storage wise we've got 6 right angled SATA 6 gigabit per second ports, however they are kind of pushed in a little bit from the edge of the motherboard, which means that using a straight SATA data cable is going to be necessary for an optimal connection here. Moving on to the bottom of the board, we find the standard array of front panel headers, alongside two RGB LED strip headers which is great, as the positioning of these allows for optimal tidy and almost invisible routing of RGB strips. Above this is the secondary M.2 slot, which is the slower of the two. Continuing along the bottom of the board, the Killer SLI, it gives us further room for expansion. Front panel audio, COM port header, TPM header, power LED and speakers, 
a couple of USB 2.0 headers and two 4 pin fan headers, one of which offers 1.5 amps again for water pumps. And we've also got the clear CMOS pins, it would have been nice to see a button in here but the pins are just fine and it's sensibly placed which means if you ever need to clear your CMOS it's not going to be too much of a hassle. Moving up the board and above the primary PCIe 16 slot is the Ultra M.2 with support for NVMe 32 gigabit per second. Taking a look above the top PCIe one time slot, there's a small M.2 slot which is for your dedicated Wi-Fi or Bluetooth combo card, which is nicely located, but as it's not hidden, you're either going to want to source a black M.2 Wi-Fi card or maybe create a custom heat spreader to hide the generally green PCBs that these little modules come in. You can pick up one of these cards from anywhere from a couple of pounds on eBay for a basic version up to 20 to 25 pounds for the latest multiband modules. Although you will be pushed to find a black one, so I would highly suggest some creative modifications. Moving on to the rear I.O. and we can see a dedicated bracket for our wireless antennas. There's also two dedicated PS2 ports for mouse and keyboard, one HDMI 1.4A port, so you will be able to use the Ryzen APUs on this board, six USB 3.1 Gen 1 headers and another pair of USB ports. One is the 3.1 Type A port and another is a Type C. And finally down the bottom we've got five 3.5mm audio plugs for the 8 channel audio and microphone input as well as the optical out. Now RGB is not the focus of this board, but with the headers and the integrated RGB around the chipset heatsink, it's not been completely forgotten about and that actually does give you a nice glow. And using the ASRock software, it can allow you to use a few various effects to customise your system's appearance and everything can be synced up nicely with the other components. But how does it actually look and was it worthwhile changing over to this X370 board? Well I'll let you guys be the judge of this. Overall, I've been really impressed with this killer SLI X370 board from ASRock. Now, it's actually on the cheaper side of the X370 spectrum, but a lot of the features that are included would actually be more at home on a high-end motherboard. We've got multiple M.2 slots, we've got the option for integrated Wi-Fi, numerous RGB headers and plenty of fan options, as well as really high quality components, a nice 12-phase power design, and the BIOS even is everything you'd expect from a top-tier X370 board. And this is all for the price, pretty much exactly the same price as I paid for that B350-F Strix board from ASUS. So the question that I've really been left with while doing this build and having a look at this motherboard is why more people haven't been using this killer SLI motherboard in their system. It ticks absolutely all the boxes. If you want a Tai Chi model, you're going to be looking at an extra 70 quid or so on top of the price of this. Likewise, if you're looking at a B350 model and you're not simply going for the cheapest B350, then it would probably really be worthwhile taking a look at something like this. Overclocking on it has been exceptionally easy. The RAM compatibility, just like I found with the ITX Vitality board, it's enabled me to get higher clock speeds than I was ever able to achieve on the B350-F. And that 12-phase power design means that there's plenty of headroom for overclocking, even on my Ryzen 7 1700. Looks are subjective, but once everything's actually in your case, the huge K on the motherboard, it's simply broken up by the graphics card and by your CPU cooler, so much so that all you're left with is a few nice white accents that are really nicely illuminated by any LEDs in your case. Now, it's not going to come as any surprise to you if you've watched this, that I've really, really been impressed by it. So much so that I don't think the B350-F will be going back into the system, I'm going to keep this killer SLI board in here. Sure, there are a few bad points like the location of the AMD RGB header, but other than that, there are no complaints that are specific to this motherboard. Of course, we would all love to see more fan headers across different places on the motherboard, but really when you get down to it for the price and for the features, if the only gripe that you've got is that one of the fan headers is perhaps not optimally located, then that'll just tell you how good this board actually is. But anyway, I hope you've enjoyed this video, and I hope it's maybe brought you something new to consider when you're building your Ryzen system. These boards can be picked up for a really good price compared to their more famous competitors. So if you're wanting high-end features on a board that's reasonably priced, looks great, and has a really nice BIOS, then, then you really can't go far wrong looking at the killer SLI X370 board. So I'm going to be keeping this in my system, I've been so impressed with this board as well as the Fatality board that I reviewed a couple of weeks ago. The fact that ASRock seen by a lot of people on various forums and communities as being a B brand to ASUS or simply not quite as good as Gigabyte or MSI. Well from my experience in these two boards, 
They're definitely the nicest 2AM4 boards that I've had to test over the last couple of years. So I hope you found this video interesting. We'll be testing this board a little bit further and I've got a few other things in the works for the weeks ahead. So as always folks, if you've stuck it out this long, a huge thanks to you for watching. Please remember to like, share and subscribe and I'll see you all in the comment section down below and in the next video.